Hi, OpenXML developers. Welcome back to part two of these screencasts on OpenXML word processing ML tables. In the last screencast, we talked in depth about the structure of OpenXML word processing ML tables. We talked about the table element and the rows and the cells. And we talked about table properties and row properties and cell properties. And we even talked about the TBL grid element and its child elements that set up a grid on which cells are laid out. For the most part, that was pretty straightforward. Now we're going to dive in deeper and we're going to get even a little bit more geeky in this screencast. We're going to talk about rendering of OpenXML word processing ML tables. Let's insert a little three by three table. And let's apply an interesting style. Let's pick this purple style. That's a pretty style for what we want to use it for. Put a little bit of data in there. Save it, close it, and let's go look at this in the OpenXML package editor power tool. The first thing that we can see here is we can see this TBL style element with a value. So we can see that that particular table style that we picked is called medium shading 2 accent 4. That particular style, it defines all kinds of things about how a table should look. And we're going to go look at that in a little bit here. But before we look at that, let's look at this TBL look element. This TBL look element has this w colon val attribute that has this hexadecimal value in there. And that hexadecimal value is really a bit mask that indicates which aspects of a table style should be applied to this table. This w colon val is part of the transitional features of OpenXML word processing ML that the strict approach to writing this TBL look element is to specify the first row attribute, the last row attribute, first column attribute, last column attribute, and etc. When you are generating a table, you can simply ignore generating that wval attribute. If you don't generate that w colon val attribute and then you go into Word and save a document, Word will add that w colon val attribute back. In some cases, it might be a little bit easier for a consumer of word processing ML to look at those bitmask values to determine which aspects of a style to apply to this particular table. But you could also just write code that would look at these attributes here. And by these attributes, you know what aspects of the style to apply to the table. So here what we can see is that on this particular table, it wouldn't matter if that medium shading 2 accent 4 table style had specified some particular styling for the last row because this last row equals 0 attribute here. Then the last row conditional formatting in that style will not get applied to this particular table. So that's what these are about. These are Boolean values that specify which of the attributes of this medium shading 2 accent 4 style get applied to this particular table. Now, if we drop down here, we can see these very interesting CNF style elements here. There's a CNF style element underneath the table row properties, and there's also a CNF style element under the table cell properties. These elements are just a convenience for the consumer of word processing ML. What this CNF style element does is it has this Boolean value first row, and that tells us that, in fact, this row is the first row. We don't have to figure that out for ourselves. We could figure out all of that information for ourselves, but this CNF style element gives it to us. So in other words, it tells us this is the first row. Then if we drop down here and we see this 
CNF style in the first cell in the first row, it tells us that this cell is in the first column. It also tells us that this cell is the first row, first column cell. We drop down to the second cell in this row. It tells us that this cell is in the first row, and it's not the first row, first column cell. If we look at the CNF style element for the second row, then it tells us that this particular row needs to take on the styling of odd H band in the conditional styling of this particular table style. We could figure that out for ourselves as we are displaying the table. We could count up all of the different rows and we could figure out which ones are the odd H band and which ones are the even H band. But we don't have to do that. We can look at this CNF style and it will tell us. If we look at the table cell properties for the first cell in the second row, it tells us that in fact this is in the first column. Let's go down to the last row. So if we look at this CNF style in the last row, you'll see that it actually says last row is equal to zero. And yet this is in the last row. Well, the question is why is that? And the reason is that if we go up to the TBL look element up here, you can see that the last row formatting is not applied in this particular application of the style, of this table style. So therefore, it won't set that value to one for that last row. If I change this markup and I change this last row to one, save it, open up the document, make some small change so that Word has to resave it, come back into Visual Studio. And now if we look at the CNF style for the first cell, we can see that this last row attribute is now set to one. So this value in the CNF style won't get set to true unless two conditions apply. The first is, is the cell actually in the last row or the first row or first column or the last column? And the second condition is, given the specification in the table look element up here at the top, is that particular aspect of the table style applied? If that aspect is not applied, then the Boolean value in the CNF style will never get set. Now, one key point is, that these CNF style elements are here only for the convenience of the consumer. The particular program that is going to render this word processing ML document, that's the only reason they're here. If you change these values such that they're not valid, Word in fact actually just ignores it. These are values that Word puts into the table markup to make it easier for other consumers of word processing ML to do the correct rendering. That's what they really are there for. When we write code to make a higher fidelity rendering of word processing ML tables, we'll be using these values as one of the ways to simplify our code. One key point about this is You'll notice also that there is this w colon val attribute with effectively a bit mask. And this w colon val attribute is also a transitional feature of word processing ML. When you are rendering a word processing ML table, you can write your code to either look at the w colon val attribute and look at this bit mask or you can look at the actual attributes, w colon first row, last row, and so on. I recommend that you only ever look at the w colon first row and last row attributes, the actual attributes that are in the OpenXML strict version of the standard. We don't need to use this w colon val attribute, which is a transitional feature. Now let's go look at styles. Here is that medium shading to dash accent for style. 
if we look down in this style, we can see that this style is based on another style. And the key point about this is that table styles have the same characteristic as non-table styles, which is that they are based on inheritance. A particular style can inherit from another style. And unless it overrides particular aspects of that other style, then the other style's styling will flow through and eventually get rendered in the document. So if it's overridden, then the styling in this particular style will be applied to the table. I'll talk a little bit more about inheritance and how you can do the inheritance, how you can write code to implement that inheritance in a bit. This UI priority, that's not important for generation, it's not important for extracting data, and it's not important for rendering. It's only important if you are writing a word processor yourself. So you don't have to generate those, you don't have to look at them. This style element has paragraph properties underneath it, it can also have table properties that are applied globally underneath it. I'll collapse these. We don't see them in this particular style, but you can also have table row properties and table cell properties as children of this style element. And those particular row and cell properties will be applied as appropriate throughout the rendering of the table. Below that, then, we see the conditional formatting for this particular style. So this is the styling for the first row. And this styling gets applied only if it is the first row and if that TBL look element specifies that the first row styling should be applied to this particular table. And underneath that conditional styling, there is the paragraph properties, we can collapse that. There are the run properties that specify what each run should look like. And below that, we can see that there are cell properties that will be applied to any cells that take on the styling as specified by this TBL style PR element. And the same thing is true for the last row, last column, and so on. Let's go look in the standard at this to, there's some interesting information in the standard. We're looking at section 17.7.6.6 of part one, and there is this TBL style PR element, the style conditional table formatting properties element. And here we can see how it describes that there are conditional table formatting properties for the top left cell, the header row, the top right cell, the first column, and so on. Further, dropping down, we can see that all the rows in the table can have conditional formatting based on whether they are in an odd row or an even row or an odd column or an even column. And dropping down a little bit further, we can see this statement here that if these conditional formatting properties are specified, then they're applied in this order. They're implied First, the whole table is applied, then banded columns are applied, then banded rows are applied, then first row, last row, first column, last column, and so on. Now, this looks a little bit complicated, but to tell you the truth, it's only going to take us 50 or 100 lines of code to write the entire logic for doing this rendering. There are some special things we have to do to do the inheritance of the table styles, and then we have to go through and apply formatting as appropriate on every cell. And you'll see the code isn't really that awfully complicated when we actually get down to it. There are a couple of blog posts that I wrote some time ago. This one was written in November of 2009. And this blog post contains interesting information in that it compares OpenXML word processing ML tables to HTML tables that are styled with CSS, and it compares them in a great deal of detail. One other post that is interesting, we can find this other post in this list of blog posts 
regarding transforming OpenXML word processing ML to HTML. And we want to look at this OpenXML word processing ML style inheritance blog post. And this blog post talks in detail about how to do the inheritance when you are rolling up the table styles in word processing ML. Down here under the section, Summary of Style Inheritance Semantics, there is a list of every element in the standard, and it tells what the semantics are, whether to merge the child elements, whether to replace child elements, and so on. The semantics of merging child elements, replacing elements, merging attributes, and so on, these are defined up here at the top of this blog post. We're going to be referring back to this blog post in detail when we finally get around to writing our transform of OpenXML word processing ML to HTML. Well, that's all I'm going to cover in this screencast. In this screencast, we talked about styling of OpenXML word processing ML tables in detail. With the information that I presented in the previous post and the information that I presented in this post, combined with those two blog posts that I looked at, you know everything that you need to know to generate OpenXML word processing ML tables. You can make them look like what you want them to look like. You can extract data from OpenXML word processing ML tables. And of course, that's actually kind of an easy scenario. And the third thing that you can do is you have all the information necessary in order to figure out how a word processing ML table should be rendered. Thanks for watching. Talk to you next time.